This is Joe Larson from the 505 on Racing Show, live every Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Watch as I dive into everything from NASCAR and motor racing, only on InRadio.com. InRadio.com. The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, InRavio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is InRavio.com. This is Joe Larson. You're watching the 505 on Racing Show. I'd like to welcome our guest tonight, Tom Rogers Jr., multi-champion of multi-divisions. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for I, having me. I, th I know you're a busy guy and all this. I appreciate you coming down to, and spend some time with us and, and, and listen to some of the people chatting in our chat room. Uh, but before we get into what Tommy Rogers does, you know, I, I spent another Saturday night here at Long Island at the racetrack at Riverhead. And... For the most part, things are changing. Mike Capiello assured me uh, via an email that things are going to be changing, things are going to be happening. And uh, there were some calls made. Whether I agree with them or not, it doesn't matter, but calls were made. And that wasn't happening um, at the racetrack and the few races I've gone to. So my hat's off to them for making some calls. Like, you know, back in the day when I was doing what, what he did, it, it's not easy. So you you got to make some tough decisions sometimes. And you're not going to be the most popular guy in the pit area at the end of the night. But as long as you're consistent in the calls that you make and you're fair in the decisions that you make, nobody really could gripe about what you're doing. So my hat's off to them uh, for what they did. The downside of what I saw Saturday was this highly taunted demolition derby. Now, I'm not into demolition derbies, and I know my, my buddy, uh, Mike Gravelbucks, uh, he's a, a world champion, multi-world champion in demolition derbies, and him and I get into discussions about whether demo derbying is racing or not racing, and, and it's kind of like uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek. We have a good time uh, discussing that back and forth. But to have a demolition derby with three cars, I, I, I don't understand that. A three-car demolition derby is not a demolition derby. You know, and I hate to say this, but back in the day, there were 50 cars, 40 cars, 100 car demolition derbies where they wrecked some cars. And uh, I, I just don't understand it. So, and I understand talking to some of the derby guys, the derby guys, the problem is it's hard to get these big old cars, which is what has affected indoor racing across the country. Of course, the cars are worth more money in scrap with the price of steel and, and whatnot, uh, what it goes for these days. So, um, that's why the demolition derbies aren't what they once were. So, Tom, figure eight race. You had a bird's eye view of what went on in that last lap. Sure did. What do you see from, from your perspective? Uh, you know, them guys were battling up front hard. And um, Roger got by Kenny. And, uh, you know, from where I was sitting, it looked like Kenny just came off the corner and took him out. You know, um, I don't agree with it, you know. Um, anybody can go down the straightaway. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roger was already in the straightaway, so. Right, yeah. You know, that's uh, that's the sad part of it, you know, is uh, it was an entertaining race, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we got held up there a little bit uh, in the back, got shuffled back there. You know, some lap cars, some cars that had flats and stuff like that. And we were working our way up toward them. But, you know, I, I run with an underfunded team. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have four tires on the car Saturday night. And uh, 
we were just trying to scrape some more money up so that we can go buy four tires for the next time we show up. Right. And uh, that was my game plan, you know, keep the car in one piece, bring it home, we could work on it a little more, make it a little better, mm -hmm. and uh, get some money together so we have four tires for the following show. And uh, we lucked out, we got a win, we got, uh, you know, extra money. Mm -hmm more than we anticipated right so now we can go out and get four more tires you know yeah from, from my vantage point, I, I watch the races from up in, in the oval part of the racetrack in, in turns uh, one and two and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm up on top there and you know I was watching this race and he said it was shaping up to be a real nice race some some good pass and some good action like you said some guys got flat spun whatever and the last couple of laps, I'm, I'm watching, this is going to be some battle. This is going to be some good side-by-side -side racing. And, and I don't agree with what, what Kenny Hart Jr. did. I don't agree with that. No, um, neither do I. Uh, like you said, he, he was, you passed cars in the straightaway. Roger had them. And yep. Roger's been racing figure eight cars for 35 years. And he just sat back, sat back, nudged them, pushed them shoved them a little bit, that's racing. Yeah, that's, that's uh -huh. part of especially figure eight racing. Right. Figure eight racing, we're making tighter turns, we're on the brakes a lot harder. There are more things that happen in a figure eight car than on any oval track that I've ever been absolutely. to. Absolutely, absolutely. And when, when Kenny came off the, the checker flags wave and Kenny came off that last corner, and if he won any wider, he would have went down to the back stretch. And he was just trying to hold Roger, and there you're, you're sitting there watching this. You're like, okay, okay, oh, wow, I might get a second out of this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it, you don't know what to do because you're watching Roger spin. You don't know if he's staying on the gas, so you don't know if you should swing wide or right. if you should hit the brake, cut down low. You know, it, luckily for me, and I think the rest of the field, Roger just stayed put. Right. You know, which is probably one of the better things that you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, if he was continued rolling and, and uh, you know, lighting the tires up, trying to finish or whatever, somebody probably would have doored him. Right. Somebody would have T-boned him. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think with Roger's experience, you know, it actually helped out that he just stayed put, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he gave up the points, gave up the positions. I'm yep. sure he was upset, you know, but uh, it saved probably a lot of equipment. Oh, definitely, definitely. and. And what transpired after that, you have, you're riding around because you're not sure what to do at this point, and, and, and Kenny's once, he's up by the officials screaming and yelling, I guess, or having a conversation, I should say. And then and there's his, his best friend in the nine car. He's over in Victory Lane. He's ready to you know, celebrate with him. And then there was a, a meeting of the officials as to what we're going to do. And uh, as you're driving around figuring out what's going on, did you know that, you probably had to win at that point. Yeah, I mean, uh, you never know anything until the officials rule. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, if you to go by the rule book, and in many cases over the past, you know, 30 years that I've been going to the track, um, second place guy spins the guy out coming for the checkered. He's going to the back, going to the back of the lap cars, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And uh, either the guy that spun finishes wherever he finishes, mm -hmm. or in like this case, they put him to the back of the lead lap cars, which was the right call because he completed the last, last completed lap mm -hmm. and the third place call won. Right. Um, you know, I mean, basically a uh, similar scenario happened with me and Timmy Salomino in the modifieds, you know, uh, in, earlier in the year. Me and him got together, you know, we tangled, whatever. The third place car won the race. Now, that didn't happen on the last lap, but the third place car won the race. You know, mm -hmm. we, we both continued on and kept going. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you're following the rule book, I think in that case, they made the right call. Right. Oh, you know? without a doubt. Without a doubt. Now, you've been doing this for a long time. I know you have the total five championships in three divisions. Uh, you have the late model championship in, two, in 2008, two championships in the figure eights in 02 and 03, and you have the um, modified championships in, uh, what was that? Uh, 2004 and 2010. 2005 and 2010. Now, you've won in just about anything you've driven. 
even going back to the go-kart days, which it was over 20 years ago. Yeah. What do you attribute that to? Uh, going to the track and paying attention, really. Paying attention. That's Just paying it. attention, you know, paying attention to the rules. I watch the rules. Um, paying attention to, you know, years ago I used to go to the track and uh, I'd watch George Brown and I'd watch Joey Biondolillo and Roger Mena. Those were the guys I watched in the figure eight cars, and I would pick just one driver out, and I would just try to listen to his motor. Mm -hmm. With all the other cars on the track, I'd listen to where he lifts, listen to where he brakes, where he's back on the gas, um, things like that. And the same thing with the modifieds. Uh, I used to watch Don Howe, Freddie Harback, um, you know, Wayne Anderson. All the guys that ran up front, week in, week out, I just go to the track, and I really pay attention. And, you know, I would go on the back straightaway, I'd go in the turn, and I learned a lot just sitting back and watching. And I usually tell a lot of the new drivers, listen, sit out of practice. <laughs> yeah. Go up there and just watch what people do. Mm -hmm. You know, really tune yourself into their car and listen to their car. And you'll learn a lot more than actually being on the track. Oh, without a doubt. You know, that took me a long time to learn back, you know, when I was driving, uh, you know, figure eight cars anyway you know, is, is what line to run, when to get on, when to get off, when to break, when not to break, um, when to go, when not to go. It, it, it was, so one day somebody said to me, why don't you just go up to the platform on, that's on the ramp and watch a practice? Yep. And, and I did that, and then the second practice I went out and I followed George Brown. Yeah, that's, that's another good thing you can do, you know. Uh, but first you gotta pay attention, listen, then try to follow Maybe not a front-running car, but maybe a fifth or sixth or seventh right. place car and just try to keep up with him. You keep up with him, you learned a little bit, and now you could go and move on mm -hmm. and try to go to that front-running car and learn even more. Right. And, and the thing I learned, you know, trying to follow George Brown is I was going to the corners so hard that I was scrubbing off all my speed. Yep. And I'm watching, like, why is he lifting here? And I'm on the brake, and I'm getting all squirrely. And then after a few laps, I went, wow. His way's a lot faster. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean, you know, it's uh, your learning curve speeds up so much. You know, um, little Vinny Biondolillo, you know, he first came there. I went out on the racetrack with him, you know, and what I did with him was I started him off slow. Mm -hmm. I would take him out there, I'd go somewhat at his pace. I'd be watching in the mirror, then I'd pick it up a little bit, let him pick it up. And uh, Vinny was actually very easy because he was to speed really quick, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, I used to do it in the go-karts with kids, you know, um, some junior kids and stuff like that. I'd have them come out, try and throw them the line and, and things of that nature. And it, it really helps them out, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, at the time, I used to sell go-karts, sold engines, stuff like that, and uh, just trying to get people involved in the sport mm -hmm. and uh, keeping them around, you know. And if you're running in the back, you're not going to stay around. Right. You know, if you're competitive, you're going to stay around. Right. And that's the main goal. I mean, when, we, uh, when I first started racing the go-karts, there wasn't a whole lot out there. Mm -hmm. When I left the go-karts, Medford Raceway was packed. Oh, it was. And we're going to take a break. We come back. We're going to talk about those go-kart days uh, with Tom Rogers. And, and so that goes back 20 years when you first started go-karts. We'll be back. Hey Beetle fans, I'm Glenn Calderon. And I'm Lucy Diamond. Join us every Tuesday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time for Beatles Across the Universe. On InRavio.com. Broadcasting to the world. Catch, Catch us. us.
Paul Brown and the Killing Devils. Alternative progressive rock like you've never heard before. Over a million views on YouTube. New York City Village Voice says Paul is a gifted singer, songwriter, and musician with one of the best progressive rock bands on the planet. LA Underground Music Exchange calls him the only modern American band to cover every genre well. Pick up the albums Black Widow Tears, Red Spider, and The Wizard's Dawn, now on iTunes. And get to Facebook.com forward slash Killing Devils to keep up with the latest info. Hi, this is Tony. And I'm Dan, and you're watching... Dear Dad. Oh, wait, you're not watching it yet, but you should be every Thursday at our new time from... 7 to 8? That's the new time. Dear okay. Dad on Enravio.com. Only in Enravio.com. Where else could it be? Tune in. On the internet. Transmission of lice occurs from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like catching a cold or a flu. You have guaranteed peace of mind in every bottle of Got Lice because all of our products are completely natural. And organic. But strong enough to cover all your lice removal needs while being safe and effective. Our professional technicians are specially trained with our exclusive proven technique to successfully comb out head lice. We come right to your home at your convenience. Whenever you want us. We bring everything needed to perform a successful and complete comb out while eliminating your head lice. And we leave you with our exclusive complimentary products to use for the next 10 days following our treatment for free our technicians also check all family members who have been exposed to lice please visit us on our website today at gotlice.co or feel free to call 24 hours a day seven days a week at 646-257-0121 the world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Radio.com. In Revio.com. Hey, we're back. So, go karts. You got your start in go karts? Yes. But you didn't get to start when you were like five years old, like a lot of kids. You were a lot older when you started go karts. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't start racing until I was 16. Yeah. You know, um, my father, I think, tried to keep me away from racing. Mm -hmm. um, I think he realized how much money he spent and everything, and he didn't want that same thing for me. So. Right. Your father drove modifieds. Yep. You know, and for a long time. Chargers even longer. Yeah. I mean, I remember your dad racing and. Yeah, uh, he was he was a good guy, your dad. I mean, he was, he was always good to me. We always talked, and we had some good laughs out out in the pits, out in the parking lot, whatever, <laughs> doing what we do. Um, but it's funny you say that. He he wanted to keep you out of this because, and and not, I'm you know I'm sure it's because of what he spent. But it's as a race car driver, you know the sacrifices you make to go racing. Yeah, uh, family, you know sports with the kids and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I'm going through that right now, you know. I got my son in soccer on Saturdays, Sundays. Um, he played baseball. So um, it, it, I want to be there and do those things with my kids, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I know when I was growing up, my mom took care of a lot of that yep. so that my dad could go racing. And uh, we'd go to the racetrack after he already left and stuff like that. But uh, back then it wasn't bad, you know. Right. We used to show up at three, four o'clock, and the place was full. Mm -hmm. But they were just starting practice. Right. So. You know, now uh, trying to be there at twelve o'clock. I got my son playing soccer from eight to ten in the morning, and uh, I got to go still load the race car, load up the trailer, mm -hmm. and then get to the track. So I usually get there like just before tire drawer at about one o'clock. Right, right. And, and, you know, and you say that, you know, years ago we used to be able to go a lot later. And I think the, the start time, the pit opening time is affecting car count. It's expecting the people in the stands because 
a lot of people work on Saturdays now, and a lot of people have kids in sports and all of that kind of good stuff, and they don't want to get to the racetrack at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, um, I think that's definitely hurting uh, Riverhead because, um, just like you said, you know, uh, nowadays the working man has to work on Saturday. Has to. He has no choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the price of admission going up and everything and the cost of everything going up, he's got to work Saturday. So for him to show up there early and get his dollar's worth is tough. Right. And for him to come at 5.30, 6 o'clock, he's already missed half the show. Right. And, and it's funny you say that. And, and that was always my... I don't want to say argument because that's the wrong word, but always the discussion I would have is the ads and in the, net web, the website said the racing starts at 6. But it really didn't because there's qualifying. Whether it's just all time trials or back in the days of heat racing, it's like with the circus. If, you know, the circus announces that it starts at 6, but there was an elephant show preliminary at 4, you missed it. Yeah. You missed all that. And, and back again when it was qualifying and you sit in the sands, hey, where's, where's my buddy? How come he's not racing? Because he didn't qualify. You know, and, and it leaves a sour taste in people's mouths. And, you know, like you said, it was, you can get there later, the place was packed. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, when, uh, when we were going there as kids, uh, I remember walking in, you know, the modifieds out practicing, the crew guys in the middle of the yep. infield. Um, w which was entertaining, you know, right. for, the, for the normal fan that goes there, he doesn't realize what these crew guys do yeah. when we pull off the racetrack. Mm -hmm. That was a perfect example right there, you know, they could, we come in, they're doing brake temps, tire temps, and, and it really gets you into, uh, into the action a little bit mm -hmm. more, and I, I think that stuff was kind of important, right. you know, and now that we got, we've gone to this qualifying format, I think it's more important to the crews and the, and the driver mm -hmm. to know, you know, all right, I'm coming right off the racetrack. Now I know what my tire temps are. Not that they cooled off 30 degrees. Right. So right. Uh, it, it's different. It, it is a different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, the days of Islip Speedway when we had all the old-timer cars out front, that was the stuff that as a kid I looked forward to. Mm -hmm. You know, I really enjoyed that. You know, and I even made a suggestion that I think they should try and get a couple of Marty Himes cars and put them over there uh, off of uh, turn three behind the, mm -hmm. the pit grandstands. Get people a little bit involved in it um, and up close. You know, even if you got a current day modified there, uh, I think it would be great if Eddie Partridge could bring out Charlie Gisumbach's car and park mm -hmm. it over there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think this is the stuff that I think the fans are missing. Yeah. And what would bring spectators. You know, and uh, and not only bring spectators, but when you bring spectators, you're bringing sponsors. Get right. the people in the stands, you know, fill the seats up, show the sponsors that they're getting their money's worth on mm -hmm. our race car as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, that, and that's key because there's an expense associated with racing, whether you're racing a modified or a street stock or whatever you're racing, there's an expense associated. Just putting on four tires. And, and get into the racetrack, fuel in the hall. Fuel, fuel. You spent a thousand dollars and you didn't unload yet. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. I mean, years ago it used to be five hundred bucks, but you yeah. know, <laughs> now with the cost of everything, you know, it, it costs us a lot of money, yeah. a lot of money. And uh, between our haulers, the stuff that we got to bring to the track, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, now guys are starting to get a little carried away with haulers, but, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they have other intentions. I got my trailer, which is a pretty big trailer. Mm -hmm. That was designed so I can go SK racing and tour racing at the same time. Yep. I remember that. You know, and uh, that's the only reason I have it. Right now, it's really too big for me to go to Riverhead with. Right, right. And, and, and you don't have a double stacker like some of these guys have, you know, like a spring cup nah. hauler with a... With a a room up front that they get a lounge, so to speak. No, my pockets ain't that deep. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, it, it is important. You know, when, when I ran the tour, um, I needed a trailer that big mm -hmm. just to carry all my stuff. Right. 
And, and you ran the tour. You, you, your first tour race, 2004, and, and I guess 2012 was your last one. And uh, you, you did decent on there. I mean, you had, uh, what, a, a top five, four top tens and, and 13 starts. Yeah. Um, you know, 2000, and I think it was 2004 or 2005, we led a, a lot of the Riverhead tour race. Right. You know, and at that time, uh, I was still relatively new to Modifods. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, um, I did some part-time stuff with, with uh, Mike Kastronakis, who bought George Brown's old car. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just kind of to help him out, and, and uh, he gave me the opportunity to drive it just to kind of see what I can do. We had no money. We were getting used tires from people. Yeah. You know, uh, just going out there riding around. And uh, when I finally felt comfortable as far as budget-wise and building my sponsorship up with the Modified, I stopped running my figure eight and went full-time modified racing. Mm -hmm. And fortunately enough, it, it paid out that year. We won the championship. So, you know, I won two figure eight championships back to back. Then I won the modified championship back to back to the figure eight. Mm -hmm. So it, it all paid off. A lot of people off. don't know that. They don't remember that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I remember a lot of stuff even before I was racing. Uh -huh. You know, I've been around a long time and. Uh, I pay attention. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, bef before I started driving cars, I was helping people in the pit area. Some people don't even remember it. Right. You know, uh, I helped John Fortin out. I was 15 years old. My father wasn't racing. I used to go to the track with Mark Lento. I used to help him out. Yeah. Um, he was partners with my dad originally in the Charger car. Okay. And then he had another baby and had to spend some time at home. He took some, some years off, and then he decided to go blunderbuss racing, and he wound up buying Fortin's figure eight car. Yep, I remember that. I went to buy it, and he's coming down Vortran Avenue in Holbrook, in Holtzville, and I'm like, just in time to be too late. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted that car in the worst way. Yeah, that but was a good car. It was, it was. Now, you know, it, it, it's funny you talk about your, your health people, your crew. You kind of worked your way through the ranks, because I remember when you showed up and, and hopped in that, that figure eight car, the probe we were talking about during break, everybody was like, where did this guy come from? But you had been around for years, like yeah. you said, helping people. Yeah, I've been around. Actually, uh, that particular year, George Brown got his kid a go-kart. Mm -hmm. I was racing go-karts. I was helping George uh, with his son. And uh, then I started helping George on his figure eight car. Uh, Mark wasn't racing that year anymore. Um, and it just, I, you know, he turned around. He says, you know what? You've been helping me out a lot. You got my kid running good. You helped me with my race car. I got this other one sitting here. He says, why don't you take it out? I was like, hey, you know, there ain't no way I'm jumping in a figure eight car, you know? <laughs> I said, but, uh, you know, I really wanted to run his modified that was sitting there. At the time, he had it just parked. Mm -hmm. Peter Pernasiglio ran it earlier in the year, and uh, I believe he ran out of money, and he couldn't continue. So uh, I said, well, if this is the only opportunity I'm going to get to show him that I could drive, to drive the modified, I'll do it, you know? and. Off to the track we went. There you go. And you did all right that first night, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the first night I started last, um, I believe it was like a 20 or 22 car field. Mm -hmm. um, George Brown was running the coupe that I'm driving now mm -hmm. and uh, got into uh, a lap car, broke the brake line off of it. I was running fifth, I think, at the time. And uh, he pulled up next to me. He said, Get out, I gotta jump in the, the probe. And uh, I got out and on the racetrack, drove the coupe off the track, went, parked it in its pit area, came back up, started watching George run. And uh, there was another yellow. The crew came running up, told me to get in the coupe. I said, I ain't getting in no coupe. This is, you know, this is my first race, I, you know. And I knew how much they had invested in that car and they, they told me to jump in it and go. And, uh, they vice gripped the right front brake line and sent me out there. And George drove with all front brake, no rear brake. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down the front straightaway, hit the brake, the car, the steering wheel ripped out of my hand, the car turned left. I said, man, I gotta drive this thing. <laughs> Don't they know this is my first time in a car, you know? But uh, it was pretty funny. That whole day was funny. Uh, we got there, I borrowed Mark's trailer to get the figure eight car there. And uh, 
We go out and practice. George says, you know, come on out, follow me. So, all right, so I pull out on the track. George pulls out a little bit behind me. They dropped the green. George was actually right behind me. I went. And uh, we pull off. I park. And George is hysterical laughing in the car. Said, what are you laughing at? He goes, he goes, I thought you were going to follow me. I said, they dropped the green. Green means go. I went. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I had a hard time catching you. I said, well, that's a good thing, you know. Yeah. And uh, it, it, was, it was pretty funny. We, we had a lot of fun. And, mm -hmm. and George is a teddy bear. He is. He, you know, people that know George on a personal level, he is nothing but a teddy bear. I, I know George, you know, I met him in the mid-70s. And he was very intimidating then. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, he was a big guy. I still didn't grow, I hadn't grown yet. I grew in college. So he was a lot bigger than me. He had this long head, this big beard, and, and he told me, you know, he said, and he, you know, come out and, and now I'm racing figure eight cars, and he's racing this Corvair that somebody had, uh, you know, purchased, and he's racing. And I remember that car. He's pounding me and pounding me. I'm like, son of a gun. So I just pulled down, and as he's going by, I kind of got into his quarter. Up and over, he flips over. I'm like, I'm dead. He's killing me. And so I get out of the car. I might as well get killed in front of a bunch of people as witnesses. I get out, and he's laughing. And I'm like, what are you laughing about? Oh, the crew told me the way I had the radiator in it would fall out. And I flipped his car and it didn't fall. <laughs> but that's how he was. Uh, yeah, that's George. And that's you know, how I met him. And uh, he was a good guy. He was always good to me, George. We, in fact, George and I got inducted into the uh, Safer Ernie Main Memorial Hall of Fame the same year. Yeah. And I saw an emotion out of him that day. And the, the tears when he got his plaque. And I'm looking. And he goes, oh, it's hot in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, from his eye. Yeah. But he, that's, that's George. Well, he, I've seen him a couple times like that. And, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I've ran with him quite a bit. Yep. And the joy to see him with his kid was, uh, was a side that you'd never seen. Mm -hmm. You know, and like you said, George was, uh, he was rough. He was rough around <laughs> the edges, definitely intimidating. Um, I had a hard time at times working with him because... What do you say when somebody's doing something wrong? How, how do you tell George Brown he's doing something wrong, right. you know? And uh, I would argue with him. I didn't care who he was. I, I'd argue with him. And he sat down, and he talked to me. And you know who else I had the same problem with? Tommy Bowen. Really? Tommy Bowen was the same way when I was working with him, helping him out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd pull up his milk crate, sit down, and say, all right, we got to sit here. Right, we got to talk. You know, but, uh, yeah, I've been around a while. Oh, yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people. We're going to take a break. and we come back, we're going to continue talking about some of the things that uh, Tommy's done in his career and some of the other issues that are facing Long Island racing today. We'll be back. of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Ravio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Ravio.com. Hey, Beatle fans, I'm Glenn Calderon. And I'm Lucy Diamond. Join us every Tuesday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time for Beatles Across the Universe. On InRavio.com. Broadcasting to the world. Catch, Catch us. us.
Paul Brown and the Killing Devils. Alternative progressive rock like you've never heard before. Over a million views on YouTube. New York City Village Voice says Paul is a gifted singer, songwriter, and musician with one of the best progressive rock bands on the planet. LA Underground Music Exchange calls him the only modern American band to cover every genre well. Pick up the album's Black Widow Tears, Red Spider, and The Wizard's Dawn, now on iTunes. And get to Facebook.com forward slash Killing Devils to keep up with the latest info. For 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. Hi, this is Tony. And I'm Dan, and you're watching... Dear Dad. Oh, wait, you're not watching it yet. But you should be every Thursday at our new time from... 7 to 8. That's the new time. Dear okay. Dad on Enravio.com. Only Enravio.com. Where else could it be? Tune in. On the Internet. back hey we, you know like I've always said this when we have guests sometimes the, the off-camera conversation is a lot more interesting than what we're talking about but, but anyway so Tayo Saturday not only did you win the figure eight feature you won the modified feature as well so you, yeah. you did a double you know so did you have armed guards follow you to the payoff window when you left yeah, I don't get any of that no. money <laughs> I wish I did but I don't get any of that money that uh, uh, you know, all my racing career, all my payoff money always went back in the car anyway. Yep. You know, uh, right now my two car owners, that money goes right back in the car. You know, mm -hmm. don't go in anyone's pocket. Um, right. Obviously, we don't make enough money no. for anything to go in our pockets. Um, you know, what it costs us to race and, and what our payoff is, is uh, not a level scale by far. No, it's not even close. So. You know, just putting the guard together this, this off-season. And, and you know what cost got me? Because you know your, your, your wheels and all your bolt-on stuff. You know that's going to cost. And your engine and your tranny and your, you know. It was the stuff that I call nickel and dime things. That yeah. are nickels and dimes. Your window net, your shifter boot, your belts, your shoes, your socks, your fire suit, your underwear, your Hans, your helmet. Yep. $6,000 later... You're all dressed up with nowhere to go. <laughs> and, and it wasn't bad. <laughs> it wasn't bad back then, you know. Now with this SFI and, and having to update the stuff, you mm -hmm. have no choice. Right. So now you look at it as, all right, you know, it cost you $6,000 back then to upgrade your stuff. Now it costs you $6,000 every two years to right. upgrade your stuff. That's right. And uh, unfortunately, I think that's what's really hurting um, the modified tour and also hurting Riverhead, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've asked Riverhead several times, you know, can we go to a five-year deal? You know, will NASCAR allow us to do this? You know, this is the only way we're going to keep cars here. Um, you know, if, if I got two, three cars, I got to update all three cars to be able to go to the track. I'm 30 grand just in updates. Right. You know, before you know it, I mean, now, you know, these seats are ridiculously priced, mm -hmm. you know, um, for, the, for the modified tour. I, I think it's just out of control. Yeah, I think with shipping, my seat was just under 3000 It, it And, and I'm, I'm losing a whole season with it, it looks like. So <laughs> I'm only going to get one season out of this thing. Yep. And I got to go get another one. Yeah. And, Hello. you know, I mean, when I ran the modified tour... At the time, my seats were 1200 bucks. Mm -hmm. My seat right now that I have, that I paid 1200 bucks, 
isn't much different from the one I'm paying three grand for. I know. You know, uh, just that, that SFI sticker means a lot and costs us a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think you're seeing it right now with the tour. Yeah. You know, I think everybody turned around and, and originally they, they were gung-ho on updating their car mm -hmm. so that they can continue running. But then uh, as it's going on, everybody's stuff's getting out of date. They stopped, you know. Um, quite a few years ago, I had talked to Kurt Chase about driving for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the biggest problems. Yeah. And Kurt yeah. was a, a long-time modified tour owner, very successful. He had some decent people driving from over the years. Yeah, John Blewett. Yeah. Um, uh, Fullers. The Fullers drove for Steve him. Steve Park. I mean, the guys know, you know, the, the guy makes it happen, and here's a guy who's not racing at all. Yeah. And it just, it, it got, the expense got out of control. You know, um, I love Bristol. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the right track for a modified number one, and I don't think uh, it's the right venue for the cost and the payoff scale for us to go down there. Um, I love Martinsville. I love Richmond. I, I think the modified should be running those tracks. Should be. Yep. Um, we're a northern based division, but we're going down south. Right. You know, uh, I know the the truck series was complaining about money and and the expense that they they had to uh, go through, and it's even the nationwide and the bush and the cup cars. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the amount of changes they went through in the past ten years. Right. How could a single car team? Keep up with that. Can't. There's no way. And uh, I think that's one of the issues that's happening. You know, um, I just I can only hope it gets better. Yeah. You know, but I think NASCAR needs to have an open mind. I think Riverhead needs to have an open mind and and listen to some of the input from the drivers. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people, you know, that I tried getting in with guest passes and everything that you know don't want to pay the extra money. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's been times where I've been willing to pay the extra money right. for them just to come, you know, and and see the car that they sponsor. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, it, it is hard. Yeah. It's it, there's that fine line. It, it's really hard to justify everything. Yeah. The years ago, when the late Bob O'Rourke was, was, I guess, the race director here on Long Island and, and other racetracks as well. I can remember going to Bob and saying, you know, Bob, I got this potential sponsor. Uh, can, can I get him in tonight? Because back then it was, the, it was you had a NASCAR license or you weren't in. Yeah. And, and he tell, and the girl that was helping him in the office, he's saying, ah, just give him a one day pass. And I'd sign the guy in, give him a wristband. And, you know, and, and that helped getting a sponsor because the sponsor saw what we went through. And, he, and back then, like you said, the place was packed. Yeah. The place was packed. And but not only that, they don't know who your sponsor is. Your sponsor may be willing to sponsor the racetrack. Exactly. Now, that opened the door for you. That also opened the door for the racetrack. Mm -hmm. You know, and it makes a difference. Right. Little things like that make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know what? They might have gave up. Back then, it was probably 12 bucks to get in. Yeah. They gave up their 12 bucks to get in, but mm -hmm. they got a racetrack sponsor out of it, maybe for five grand for the year. Right. I know a, 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 a division sponsor, I'm not gonna say who it is, that was sponsoring the figure eights for years. And, and it's not the one that everybody thinks, it's just another one. And, and he used to have a night with his company where he sponsored the race, double points, extra money. And he's allowed with his deal, 20 people. 22 people showed up. Now, how does he, the guy brought his kids, but, you know, he didn't plan on that. So instead of the track just letting it go, they called him on Monday and wanted him to immediately send a check for those two people. Yeah. And he said, you're kidding, right? And it's kids. Yeah. And it's kids, so, yeah. you know, uh, what was that, $6 a kid? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so he says that. He goes, are you kidding? No, well, you know, the deal was you got 20, you had 22. He sent that check for that $12 or whatever it was, and he never sponsored again. Yeah. He, uh, I don't even think he goes there anymore. All it did was hurt the drivers. Yeah. Uh, and the racetrack, I mean, really. You know, it hurt the drivers and the racetrack. And uh, I'm sure 
maybe he sponsored somebody else in a division here or there somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the most of the track sponsors have a car that they're on. Absolutely. You know, and uh, it just hurts all around. Right. And I know he helps a couple of guys out now, and, and what, how much? You know, that that that's not relevant. But the track and that division lost a long time sponsor. And I'm not I'm not here to bash the racetrack because I'm sure this happens everywhere. There aren't marketing people that work for these racetracks. They might have the title, but they don't do the job. Well, I don't think, I mean, I'm taking wrong too. You know, I try to help the racetrack. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to give them good ideas. You know, there's times I talk to uh, Steve Tucker and um, Mike Capiello. Uh, I talk to him on the phone, you know, or at the racetrack, whatever it may be. And I try to give my input on what can help, you know. And uh, I don't know where there's an issue. I don't know if I'm the only one that speaks up and they think I'm nuts, you know. But, you know, the, the fact is I'm there to help the racetrack. I want to make it better. I want to make it more mm -hmm. fun. Um, and it does get frustrating. It gets very frustrating when uh, I've put a lot into trying to help the track. Mm -hmm. And it just... They don't want to do nothing. Right. I know. They, they're so afraid of change, you know, and right now we're dealing with modified tires. We can't maneuver a car. It's boring for the fans. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's not entertaining. If we don't do something, I've already heard three to four different teams that said, you know what, there is no point in me coming. I've changed the setup. I've changed the car. Um, you know, we've done everything p that we could possibly do. It's just, mm -hmm. it's not reacting to the tires, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I tell guys all the time, I'm like, listen, you know, your setup will still work. you got to drive the car a little bit different, but it isn't any fun. I, it's very boring for me to run a modified right now, where... Years ago, it was fun. You know, you could drive on the outside. You could challenge. You know, you could do a switch over. You know, mm -hmm. you can't do that now. Yeah. And you from can't. a fan's perspective, as I go there now as a fan, I sit in the grands as I watch. You know, and, and especially with the qualifying format, with the time trials and a redraw, it's a parade without music. The modified race, yeah. without a band, it's a parade. You invert the top ten right now. That's the way they'll finish. Exactly. You know. Um, the other thing that uh, I'm not a fan of is them taking the speed bumps out. Mm -hmm. You know, we took a track that's under a quarter mile. It's not a quarter mile. Nope. No matter what anybody says, it's not a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. um, and we shortened it up more. So it was hard to pass to begin with. Now you made it harder to pass. Right. Uh, you know, granted, they, they tried giving us a little more room. I don't think that was the answer. No. I don't think it was the answer. Um, personally, one of the issues you've got right now as a driver is if you're on the outside, you don't know if the car on the inside is going down to what used to be the speed bumps or if they're going to the old racing line where the banking is because it's flat. Mm -hmm. Once you get below where, where the old speed bumps is, it's flat. Mm -hmm. So how, if you're on the outside, how do you make your arc into the corner? It's, right. it's, it's a guessing game, you know, where before you knew they were going to the yellow line. Mm -hmm. You yep. knew they were clipping that left front on that speed bump to help turn the car, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think if we had the speed bumps right now with the tires we have, you'd probably hit it and you'd probably catapult yourself in the wall anyway. Exactly. Because they're just not there. The, the Poochie Pooch, bump in the chat room is asking, what exactly is wrong with the tires? They just have no side bite. They have no side bite. They have no forward bite. Um, I don't know if they're dried out. I don't know if they're having a chemical issue at the plant. I don't know what it is, but they're not maneuverable. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran the same tire last year, two years ago. We set the track record on this tire. Now we can't. I was the only car in the 11s. Mm -hmm. Track record's an 11.5 something, I think it is, right. that we only turned two years ago. We all didn't forget how to drive and set up a car. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, 
You can say that the track needs repaving. The track was weathered at 30 years, and they went out there and set the track record. Yep. So it, it can't be the repaving. Mm -mm. You know, uh, yeah, paving it would be better. I don't know if that's going to help. No, and, and it's got to be paved right, and that's, that's really expensive. You know, and, and yeah. I noticed, you know, I walk around the pits throughout the afternoon and, and even afterwards a little bit, and one of the things I noticed that I have never seen on a modified is after a race or after a practice, there were rubber, there's rubber on the Nerf bars. <laughs> I don't see that anymore. Well, that's the other issue. Uh, I mean, this year, my car owner decided to go to a white car. Why? I have no idea. I'm not a fan of white. But I haven't cleaned the car in six weeks. I have no rubber on it. Mm -hmm. Anywhere. And uh, you're right. You know, I'm not cleaning out the radiator. I have no rubber wrapped around my quarter bars. I have no rubber under the interior tin. The, the tires just not really working. Uh, we're coming in. We ran 100 laps last week. Center line still on the tire. That shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> years ago, uh, my center lines were gone in, in qualifying. We yeah. run two hot laps, they were gone. Gone. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what it is. You know, um, I can't really say who's to blame. Mm -hmm. You know, I, do I think it's, it's TS? I don't think it's TS. TS is the tire the distributor for the race. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't think he has anything to do with it. I, I'm not really sure. Right. You know, all I know is that the tire ain't working. Right. And, and, I, and, and in Eddie's defense, Eddie Parches, who owns TS all, is and he's the tire distributor. In his defense, all, from my understand, he drives up, gets a load, brings them back. Yeah. They I say, mean, take those, okay, he loads his trail and goes. Yeah, you know. <sighs> Remember years ago when we had uh, American Racer or McCleary, mm -hmm. and we went to all 100% Hoosier track? Yep. I don't know if maybe uh, Hoosier in Indiana says, you know what, it doesn't matter because they're running 100% our tire. They have no competition to compare these things to. We can give them all the junk we got. I, maybe that's it. I don't know. Maybe. You know, but the fact is, is that Last year, maybe two years ago, definitely two years ago, almost 100% of the field was in the 11s. And we had 22 to 24 cars every night. The 12-2, 12-4 car was slow. 12-2, 12-4 car was in the way. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. Uh, this is only two years later. The track's shorter, so we should be even faster, and we're slower. And we're slower. And we only got... This past week, we got one car in the 11s. Two weeks ago, we had three cars in the 11s. You know, and the car that set the track record ran a 12-0. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all right, not everybody could be spot on every week, but he ain't even in the ballpark. No. You know, and I know the, the winter's taking a beating on, on the track, but I don't think it's that. All the other divisions pretty much seem to be running the same speed. Mm -hmm. The modifieds are the ones that fell off. Right, and, and they have big time. You know, time. I, I, I just, I don't know what the answer is, but I'd like to see, I'd like to see a tire war, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it makes the tire company put out a better product. Mm -hmm. When they put out a better product, us as drivers can put out a better product to the fans. And it, it's a cycle. And, and more fans come, and more money, and more this, and more cars. More sponsors. Fans and race cars and sponsors, it goes hand in hand. Yes, and uh, it's important. Right now, that's an important part to our racing, especially in the modified division. Absolutely. And hey, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the, the NASCAR Wheel and Southern Modified Tour and uh, a little bit about their scheduling and why they do what they do. We'll be back. This is Gina Cotillo from The Gina Show. Come join us every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for Celebrity Interviews, Reality Real with Billy Charles, 
Funny, funny stories with Brian Guineer and much, much more. The Gina Show can be found only on InRadio.com, broadcasting to the world. So come and catch us. For 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Radio.com. Hey, we're back. Hey there. So the NASCAR Wheel and Southern Modified Tour will return to action July 4th. And uh, they've been on a break since early May. They don't race in May. They don't race in June. And July 4th, they come back. And, you know, and the reason for that is the Southern Tour does not want to compete for fans and cars against Bowman Gray. It's like an unwritten rule. Because they, a lot of their tour regulars race weekly at Bowman Gray. Wow. And, and they already have a car count situation, just like the Northern Tour. So if they were to try to compete head-to-head... -head, they'd probably lose out. They'd lose out. There's no question about it. Because Bowman Gray has been around forever. Forever. And uh, they got a strong car count. I think a lot of uh, short tracks need to figure out what they're doing. Yeah. Because uh, they're in a football stadium with 30,000 seats, and I can't see one of them empty. No. And they turn people away. Uh, they're I doing something there, right. Yeah, I went there once, and I think the admission was 
ten dollars or eleven dollars. Now I know it's the deep south and, and cost and uh, different, but you know, a guy goes with his wife and his two kids. He's in the door for forty bucks. Yes, the and working family. The work, the, and that's who goes to the races for the most part. Is the the, the working guy he wants to. Go out, not kick back, have a couple of beers, watch the races, go in the pits, get autographs, grab a burger off of somebody's grill for free, and, and be on their way. But, and I've always said this, and, and not just about my local racetrack, I've said this about a lot of racetracks. The working guy has $100 to spend that week. Why take the whole 100 at the gate? Yeah. You're gonna get that 100. <laughs> Well, I mean, I got a perfect example for you. Uh, I bought a race car, was going racing. I couldn't bring my, my girlfriend and my kids or my wife and my kids. There were times where I'd take my car insurance money, go racing and say, man, I got I to gotta hope I finish fifth to make this money back. Mm -hmm. You know? And you had to play it safe. Yep. You know, uh, when you're running low budget, you didn't have much of a choice, yeah. you know? Uh, over the years, I, I bought some teams out, teams were selling out, I went to their shops, I'd buy whatever that I could, you know, and stockpile all my stuff, that, that's what kept me going in racing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I didn't have sponsors back then, I right. just started, yeah. you know. Um, so it was a lot different, you know, and it was, like I said, it was hard, you know, um, even kid friendly. Right. Oh, definitely. You know, uh, I'm a single parent. I don't know how many people uh, pay attention, but there's no changing tables in men's rooms. Good point. Where am I supposed to change my kid? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's one of the things they really need to look at. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I tried changing my, my daughter out in the parking lot. They wouldn't let me go out in the parking lot. What do you do? You know, it's, it's, it's funny. I had friends that came to the track and, while I was still officiating there. And um, he walked in at 1 o'clock in the afternoon with his sunglasses on, and their prescription sunglasses. Now the sun sets, he realized he left his regular glasses in the car. They wouldn't let him go get them. You know, it's uh, common sense things. I mean, you know what? Uh, I understand with the security and, and stuff like that. Um, I get it, you know, uh, people doing stuff in the parking lot, whatever. But when they come back in, you could check them. Absolutely. You know, listen, I, I mean, I'm carrying my kid in my hand. You know, you want to smell a diaper? You know, yeah. Yeah. Some, some stuff you got to let slide. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be fan friendly. Right. And uh, you don't know who that fan is. No. And, and Bowman Gray is is very fan friendly. The fans might might not be friendly, but the place is fan friendly. I mean, that place is crazy. Yeah, well, you crazy. know, the, that's the way you gotta be. You know, um, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to see more people in the stands. I, I'd like to try to get as many people in the stands as mm -hmm. we can. Mm -hmm. uh, as a driver and as a, a car owner, it's only gonna benefit us. Right. You know, um, Saturday night, we had a decent crowd. Um, it was. It was a decent crowd. You know, <sighs> advertisements, uh, maybe running some sort of specials, you know, to get people in the seats, especially in the, in the colder months. Well, that place was empty. That place was empty the first few weeks. Well, from a deal, if I'm going to go out there and freeze, at least let me freeze for $15 over, you know, $30 or right. something. I... Uh, we got to figure out a way. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, whether the drivers, car owners, officials sit down with the owners, you know, uh, just got to realize that the working family, you know, can't afford to do it. You know, mm -hmm. they're working Saturdays because they have to pay bills. They're not working Saturdays because maybe their boss makes them. They're working Saturdays because they have no choice. I have no choice. That's right. And, you know, you look at it. it a hundred dollars just to get in the gate. By the time your night's done on a cheap night, it might be 150. Mm -hmm. You know, that's 600 dollars a month. Yeah. You know, that's a car payment. That's a, a repair a, bill on a on a car. Uh -huh. That's fuel oil. Right. You know, and uh, listen, I, I understand 
track owners are there to make money. Absolutely. They got to make money. And I've always said that. I don't but begrudge that. quantity might help them make more money. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you have 5,000 seats and you, your ticket price around them is $20, and only a thousand people come. You made twenty grand, but if you have a ten dollar ticket and it's packed, you made fifty grand. Yes. Uh, it, it's to me, it's simple math. I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, I've been there a long time. My family's been involved a long time. Uh, my grandfather raced on the place when it was dirt. You know, I got pictures of of him there. You know, uh, running against Junior Ambrose's car, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that that's kind of special to me, you know, Dri driving for Joe and everything, and the Ambrose family, and they are a great family. They're yeah, really, good people. They really are a good family. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you drive for, for, for the Ambrose family. Who are some of the people that, that helped make that happen? Um, that particular year, you know, we were going to a race, and... Um, I just got off my championship in 2010. 2011, we were going, we were going uh, tour racing. And actually, uh, Joey, the officials called Joey up, I guess, and wanted to, you know, ask why the car wasn't there. And, uh, you know, he, whatever answer he gave him, and uh, his driver uh, moved, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think Andrews was still driving for him yeah, at he, the time. He moved south. He moved south. He moved to Florida. And uh, they said, well, you know, he didn't want to run a full deal. He didn't want to run a full schedule. And they said, well, Tommy's running the tour. I don't know if he's running the whole tour or not. Why don't you try and give him a call and see if maybe you guys could strike a deal? And uh, he did. We talked um, on the phone. And then uh, I guess by the end of the week or so, uh, I made an arrangement to go out and meet him out at the shop. And we sat down, we talked some more. And uh, Joey was, at that time, he was kind of bummed out about racing. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, now I kind of think it's the other way around. He wants to go racing, and I'm bummed out about racing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, it's definitely different than it was. 10 years ago. But the officials paired us up. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, you know, and, 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 and some of the officials ain't even around no more. They yeah. paired us up. Yeah, I mean, and, and I know they tried because I know, you know the Ford and his three cars were going to, to Pennsylvania to go racing, and over the winter they talked to him and tried to bring him back. And, and as, as much as, as John, I know John a long, long time from back when he raced the demolition derby at ISO. And and, and, and I'm going to say this, and, and it's going to upset him if probably if he ever is. Sometimes he's his own worst enemy. And, and you know, he came, they asked him to come back, and, and he was hoping for things to be changed and things to be different. But he, as a driver, owner, whatever, had to change as well. And He's under a lot of pressure. Absolutely. And I don't disagree with that. Um, and, and I know it's not cheap to, to run one car, and he's running three, and... The other two were his kids, and that's a whole different mindset. I know I, I, I did an interview with him that, that uh, we, we couldn't air for, for whatever reason, but uh, not anything John did. It was a good interview, but you know, he, he said, he goes, you know, I'm a father first, but on the racetrack, I'm, you know, they don't give me, they don't move over because I'm coming. But you know what, I, I know if I was racing with my kid and I saw somebody stuff him in the fence, my gut reaction is, I got to take care of that guy. He just put my kid in the wall, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not saying he races like that, but the emotion runs high when it, it's the night's over or the race is over, and now you're back in the pit area. And then what happens is the wives and the girlfriends and the boyfriends and, and you know. That's two, a whole nother story. We could do a whole nother, nother show on that. You know, t two drivers could be cursing each other out on the track, pushing and shoving in the pit area. And at the end of the night, they're having a burger and a beer together, and it's over. But you know, well, I, I mean, um, I used the example of me and Dave Sapienza got together on the racetrack. The next day was his daughter's graduation or, or something. I was at the house. We were having a party, you know. I'm there to race. I'm mm -hmm. there to win, but I'm there with my friends. Right. I grew up around this racetrack. Mm -hmm. These are the people that are my friends. You know, John's a friend of mine. Right. I went away racing with him 
uh, to Pennsylvania last year. And, you know, it's tough. He, he has two businesses going or three yeah. businesses going. Uh -huh. You know, and I told John, you know, listen, let the kids deal with their racing. You deal with your racing. Try to keep them separate. You know, and I know it's hard. Uh, my son wants to race go-karts. After a Saturday night, the last place I want to be back is at back track. at the racetrack on I a Sunday. I, I went through that with my kids. I had four kids in go-karts. I, I leave Riverhead Raceway at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm back at go-karts at 8 in the morning Sunday. And all the kids that are driving, most of them their fathers race Saturday night. They want to rehash the night with me. And I remember telling Jack all there, Jack, do me, I'm here with my kids. Leave well, me alone. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's another thing, you know. Um, what happens on the racetrack stays on the racetrack. Yeah. I mean, I pull out of the, off the racetrack, you know, I don't go running over yelling and screaming. You know, when I first started, yeah, I, I was, I didn't have the money. You know, I'd get run over, you know, just like John, little John and, mm -hmm. and Amber or something like that, they're getting run over. You know, you get upset, you know, especially oh, when, when yeah. you know it's going to cost you a ton of money you don't have. You know, um, but once I, fi I got financially stable off the racetrack, as soon as we pull off, that's it. You know, we go home, that's definitely it. You can't bring it back. If yeah. you bring it back next week, all you're doing is costing yourself more money. Yep. You, know, you got to go there to race. Every week's a new week. Um, and, and that's just the way I race. You know, mm -hmm. I jump out of the modified, I get in a figure eight car. I don't take what happened in the modified to the figure eight car. No. no. You know, um, last Saturday night, we ran a 100 lapper for the modified. I ran a charger car and a figure eight car. You know, all back to back. Right. And it's tough. It's not easy separating it all, but you have no choice. Yep. It, you you know, know, and Joe Batuccio, owner of Gershow Motorsports, as everybody uh, and throughout the, the racing community knows, Joe and I, back in the day, race night, we didn't get along. We did <laughs> not see eye to eye. There were nights he threatened to kill me, blow up my house, all kinds of stuff. And uh, something happened outside of racing. The only guy I knew in Long Island that could help me fix this was Joe. I was a little apprehensive about going to see him about it. So I go, and I told him what my predicament was, my situation, and I knew he could help. And uh, he reached into his pocket, and he made it happen. Yeah. And I said to him, Joe, i got to be honest with you, I'm surprised that you're helping me out. He goes, why? I said, ah, oh, you know, the track, whoa, 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 whoa. Saturday is Saturday, Sunday through Friday. He goes, I've known you since you were a little kid. He goes, Saturday, Saturday. Yeah. And that took me a long time to learn with not only him, but other people, that once the race is over, it's over. Yeah. No screaming is going to change. And no fighting is going to Banging people's carburetors off with jackhands is not going to change the outcome. You know? I know that one too well. <laughs> That's why I said that. You know? I also remember somebody else jumping on a car yeah. after a race. I'm not going to mention his name or the people involved, but... Uh, that was quite a few years ago. Yeah, it I was. think that was '93. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and I said to somebody in the stands just just this, this past week, I said, you know, you want to cut down some of this nonsense, this after race wrecking people, the race is over and people are crashing into you. The fine is whatever it costs to fix that guy's car, That's, and I you don't race that. again until his parts bill is paid, and that nonsense will stop. And you know, you do it con consistently. Consistently. Yes. yes. You know? I mean, you know I, and I did that a few times to people. I did that to, to Keith Tarapicchio when he deliberately drove into James Papes' trailer because he felt it was in the way, and I made I him pay that. for the trailer. Al Amarino jumped all over somebody's car and broke stuff. He paid for the damage. <laughs> <laughs> that was how I handled it. And that nonsense started to dissipate. I mean, you know, some of it's nothing new. You right. know, I remember toolboxes going over the fence. Yeah. You know, um, it's just, I, I remember a certain driver flipping over your desk, you know. Yes. And uh, him getting suspended as well. But uh, Biggest he, fine I ever levied. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it got reduced by NASCAR. $10,000 that was. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even going to go further with that one. But... Um, <laughs> You know, 
It's your job as an official to do it, though. Uh -huh. You know, and um, I think what wound up happening was the NASCAR have at it attitude. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they stopped officiating, and they left it to the drivers to handle. At, at every level. Every level. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. At every level. And that's NASCAR's have at it attitude. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Big Bill France, he was there for the races, and the fans came, mm -hmm. and the sponsors came. Yep. Now, they're all after the money and the sponsors, and we got no fans. We got no cars. You know, uh, we got no sponsors. Again, at every level. At every level, all the yeah. way up. I, I say you take you take the multi-car teams out of Spring Cup and, and allow them to have one car, you have 30 cars. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, right again, back in the day, 50, 60 cars would show up to qualify, and you, they were sending home 15 cars some weeks in, in the in the cup level. Now it's you know with this new qualifying, you're in, you're in. Well, here again, here's the issue. Um, we had. 50 cars for a cup race, single car teams. Now, how many cup teams have three, four, five cars? Mm -hmm. So if they added cars to their stable or to their team, we should have another 20, 30 cars on top of the 40 we already had, exactly. 50 we already had, mm -hmm. trying to qualify. Right. You know, um, it's, uh, I understand it's harder. It's definitely more expensive. Without a doubt. But these guys are making it happen. Yeah, and, and, and it is. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about an incident that uh, happened at Stafford Motor Speedway this uh, past June 6th uh, to a local team here when, when we come back. For 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. Hey, this is Gina Cotillo from The Gina Show. Come join us every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for celebrity interviews, reality reel with Billy Charles, funny, funny stories with Brian Guineer, and much, much more. The Gina Show can be found only on InRadio.com, broadcasting to the world. So come and catch us.
Brown and the Killing Devils. Alternative progressive rock like you've never heard before. Over a million views on YouTube. New York City Village Voice says Paul is a gifted singer, songwriter, and musician with one of the best progressive rock bands on the planet. LA Underground Music Exchange calls him the only modern American band to cover every genre well. Pick up the albums Black Widow Tears, Red Spider, and The Wizard's Dawn, now on iTunes. And get to Facebook.com forward slash Killing Devils to keep up with the latest info. Hey, uh, Jerry Salamito, crew chief for the uh, 75 team, driven by his son on the NASCAR wheel in Modified Tour, was, was penalized for a rules violation committed during practice June 6th at Stafford Motor Speedway. The infraction, a P3 level penalty, violated section 12-1 and 20D-2.3 in properly attached weights. Apparently, uh, Salamina was fined $500 and suspended from NASCAR until the fine was paid. Basically, the, the weight rule is this. Added weight, and that's what you do to get your right percentages and stuff, must be securely bolted to the frame rail with a minimum of two 3 8 inch diameter bolts painted white with the car number or team identifier on it. Uh, apparently, one of his weights only had one bolt on it and was not attached to the frame rail, from what I'm told. Now, I tech these cars for years, for years. And what we would do is when we caught a guy or a team that their weight wasn't on right, I told them to fix it. Yes. This guy goes out and practice. And you know what, he probably went over the scales and, and it's, it was probably a little block, and I don't know, I didn't talk to him. And the maybe, the, was, maybe the bolt was loose and it just fell out. Exactly. So you, you don't give them the opportunity to correct. It's, it's, in my opinion, it's not a safety issue. Well, wait a minute, we are talking to modified. Yeah. All right, so you could have ground the head of the bolt right off of the thing. Yeah, exactly. A flat tire, you know, yeah, anything. Yeah. The only thing that I find amazing out of that penalty is that was a Friday night show. How do you race on the weekend without paying the fine? You know, but <laughs> like I said, this is, this is part of the problem, you know? I see where you're going with that. NASCAR ain't going to pay, you're not going to pay NASCAR cash. No. You got to send them a check. And, you know, exactly. And they're uh, going to mail the penalty to you. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I, I, me personally, if that happened to me, I'd be a little upset. Right. right. Because how am I supposed to go racing on Saturday? This is Friday night. Mm hmm You know, Saturday. Richie Evans, Charlie just on back and everybody, they race Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, Tuesday. Seven nights a week. How do you, you know, I mean, unless they handed it at the next racetrack or something like that, which if they did that and accepted that, that's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, they don't make it easy for their drivers and their, and their owners. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I always tell guys that I know that, that have gotten suspended or fined, just appeal it. Pay the appeals fee. You buy a few weeks. Um, Cost you more money. Cost you a little more money. <laughs> but, you, you know, you, you, you're buying a few weeks. You know, you got a double pointer coming up or a special event coming up, you appeal it. Yeah. If you know there's nothing happening, single point, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, I, Frank Vigarola, when I penalized him way back in 2001. Which time? Cause yeah, which time? I, there, there was plenty of them. The, the one where he ended up, like, being out for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> by, by the way, that's another guy that I worked on his car. Yes, you did. But um, um, he, he appealed it, and then he lost the appeal, and then he went to the national appeal and lost that appeal, too. And by that time, you know, half the season went by. So... 
Well, but, you, you know, uh, one thing I want to say about that, that suspension and that fine or whatever they, they did there. Now, here is a local level guy trying to make a name for himself, mm -hmm. trying to run the tour, and you're beating him up right away. Right. You know, um, Timmy's running well, and uh, he's running up front. Congratulations to him, you know. But where does it stop? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it costs you a lot of money. It's a lot of time trying to get there. Like I said, he could have drove off the racetrack with a flat tire, or, you know. Broke the bolt off. And bolt the, broke the bolt. Absolutely. I mean, you know, had they catch that in practice? Right. Usually, uh, you know, when we go to the tour, they're under there with a creeper. I know you've been down there with a yeah. magnet and, yeah. and everything else, you know. I, I don't understand it, you know. Um, we had some of the problems where on the tour, your, your car, the motor, the carburetor gets teched. You go out your time trial, they're retucking your carburetor again. Mm -hmm. Now, your carburetor's hot. Now you're taking a hot carburetor. You know, I understand some guys are trying to get away with some things. But, Absolutely, of course. But with the close tolerances that you've got to run these days in order to be competitive, you can't be taking stuff hot. It's got to be room temperature or air, air temperature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thing that kind of upset me was, uh, I don't know if you remember in 2011, we had a two-day show at Stafford. Um, guy went out there, blew up his uh, Ford motor. They allowed him to use a backup car with a Chevy motor. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, Justin Bonsignor uh, goes out there, blows up a motor in practice, and this was before qualifying. The other car was during qualifying. During qualifying. Okay. Um, they made him unload his backup car pull the motor out of his backup car to put it in his primary car to go out and qualify. And I think that was unjustice. That was a one-day show mm -hmm. when it, where Justin had to do that. And uh, I think he should have been able to just pull out his backup car and, and go racing. Like everybody else was able to. Uh, uh, that's kind of the purpose of bringing a backup car, I thought. Exactly. I didn't know it was a parts car. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I saw in some uses, not only did a driver get to pull out a backup car, but another team pulled out a backup car for that driver, and it was allowed. And you know, those are some of the things that I had taken issue with over the years, and, and it was the inconsistency of this guy can do it, but this guy can't. And there's mitigating circumstances, that's why we let him, and that's why we didn't let him. And, and again, I'm not trying to put down the job that the guys do, because it, it all comes from above, and it all trickles down. But be consistent. You know, and, and, and if you say A, it should be A all the time. It can't be B today because, you know, the, your pizza was cold, you know. It, it's it's got to be right. I mean, as a driver and, a, and an owner at that time, to me, that was a downer. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a really downer for me, um, as well as uh, them canceling the TV deal or, mm -hmm. the, or the TV uh, getting sold out and nothing being picked up, nothing being done about right. it. Yeah. It was kind of brushed under the table. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when you turn around and you sell your sponsor on 11 shows or nine shows or whatever it is. Now what do I do? Right. How do I turn around and say, oh, you know, you're not gonna be on TV? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You lied. I lied just to get the money. <laughs> do you even have race cars? You yeah. know. It, uh -huh. it, it's a trickle down effect, and and it was a it was bad. Uh, right. You know, maybe it was a bad year for me to go tour racing, but it was definitely an eye opener on what they did. Right, and you know, and and I remember, <laughs> and it's John Wellman who helped us both out for many many years. A uh, great guy. He came to me and he said, "This guy Phil Kerr is from Wheeling. You have his number. So I'll do you one bet. He's right there." <laughs> yeah, I remember that day. <laughs> and they went. They, they went, they sat down, they, they had a long talk. What transpired is it was between them, but the bottom line is there was still no TV, but Phil was agreeing. Yes. Phil agreed, yeah, you're right, we need to do this. And, you know, 
When Phil you, was awesome. I love that guy. That guy, guy was awesome. Great he was guy. here for the modifiers. Yes, he was. You know, and then, and and he's a true fan we of the modifiers. You know, yeah. there you go. He's a, a and and he's approachable, and if he says this is how it's going to be, that's how it's going to be, and and that's one of the things I, I respect Phil Kerr's. And one of the things when when I hung up my official shirt and, and the next event I went to, him, I said, Phil, I just want you know, I don't know what you were told, what you heard, but. You know, I'm no longer an official. I'm helping Wade. And his first words to me, Wade's a great guy. He needs a guy like you helping him. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that was, it was all good. Wade was cool. You know, we parked next to him. Oh. And he's another one underfunded. You know, it, it was good. I, I don't know how he has three cars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, and, you know. You know, you had guys like Phil. You had, um, uh, I forget the other guy's name on the tour. Tour official. Not Jimmy Wilson? Not Jimmy. I'll think of it. All right. Uh, but you had a bunch of great guys that were just trying to make it better. You know, it, it's, you know, I was on the tour. I worked part time on the tour in 2000, 2001, 2002. And then in 2003, I went in as race director, and it, it was so different then. We had th twice as many cars, I'll, I'll stop and say, twice as many cars, half the number of officials. We worked hard, but we played hard. Yeah. And, and it was one big happy family, and we got along. And everybody That's helped each other. That's what the whole racing community right. should be. And, you know, after the races, you went out to Camperland at some racetrack, and, you know, who was barbecuing steaks, chicken, hot dogs, and whatever it was, and everybody was welcome. And then there was a change. And, and, and it wasn't overnight. It was gradual. All of a sudden, that tight-knit group was broken up. And you had guys and gals from the South, guys and gals from the Midwest, guys and gals from the Far West. The New England, Long Island, Jersey group was no longer. And when you look at what's there now, what was there 10 years ago, official-wise, you could count the officials on, on one hand that are still there from years ago. Um, why they're not there, I, I can only guess. I know why I'm not there. And I know why a couple other people aren't there, but it changed. And, and they didn't like the camaraderie, and they didn't like the fact that this official's husband was on that crew, and this official's wife was on that crew, and this, they didn't like that. You know what? I'm sorry to say it, but that's going to happen. Absolutely. Oh, without a doubt. Because this is the sport. Yep. Okay. Um, you know what? Maybe your wife don't want to be an official, but she wants to be around the track. She wants to hang out with her friends mm -hmm. who's part of this team, yep. whatever. Who cares? Exactly. As long as you're doing your job as an official, who cares? Yeah, I, really, I really don't care. You know what? It shouldn't matter. You know, one of the things that... As long as your job is being done. Yeah, it, absolutely, and I agree with that. And Well, I don't know, some people in it. Uh, well, let's see. everybody's got a complaint. Yeah, Poochie Bump is asking you, from your point of view, did Justin jump the start? Well, um, I'd have to say, if you go and you look at the videotape, there's no question he jumped the start. Um, whether or not Justin wasn't aware of it, uh, you know, it's possible. He hasn't been there all year. Uh, he has been in the stands. Um, he was not at the meeting where it was told uh, that there was going to be zero tolerance on it. Your warning was at the meeting. Our warning was at the meeting. Yeah. That's it. That's what you got, you know. Um, Justin went early, you know. I think, uh, I think he knows now that he went early. Uh, did it affect anything? Yes and no. Uh, I did get a little late start on it, on that restart. Um, maybe I wouldn't have been up in the fence, you know, uh, off that restart. I could have been probably further up or with a wheel. Uh, you know, but I've also been sent to the back for the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he made a mistake. He right. tried getting the advantage. Uh, you know, I'm not the easiest person on a restart either. You know, we're all trying to get that edge, and when you don't have good tires, you need every edge you can. And I think Justin was doing his job as a driver. Uh, he's there to win. 
uh, just like I am. You know, we don't go there to run second. We don't go there to ride around. We go there to pass. We go there, you know, to make moves and move forward. Mm -hmm. um, accidents do happen. You know, um, I think a lot more of them are happening because of the tire, possibly. Side-by-side uh, -side racing, at least with the modified, doesn't seem to be happening. No. And I don't think it's possible to happen. No. No. Um, I really, when I've been on the outside, I've really worked my tail off to stay out there. Where in years past, I didn't have to run as hard as I did on the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, um, just to keep up. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are, when you see a guy on the outside, I guarantee you he's doing 150% in that race car right mm -hmm. now. Oh, yeah. He's working overtime. Yeah, without a doubt. Anyway, speaking of overtime, Junie Dunleavy died last Monday at 90 years old. Oh, there's a, a he, blast from the past there. He, he fielded cars in 863 NASCAR races from 1950 to 2002. Uh, 2002, and he was 90? Well, he, he, he died last week. He was 90. 90. So. And, so uh, he was 78 years old. Yeah. He earned one victory as a car owner. That was with Jody Ridley in 1991 at Dover. Wow. This is a blast from the past. And then according to NASCAR.com, NASCAR Hall of Fame nominee Ray Fox died. He was 98. Fox was an engine builder, car owner, and crew chief. Fox, a New England native, saw his first race at a two-mile board track at Rockingham Park near Salem, New Hampshire. His engine won the 1955 Daytona Beach Road Course race with driver Fireball Roberts. Unfortunately, the motor was found illegal, having modified push rods. Then in 56, Fox was named Mechanic of the Year after winning 22 of the first 26 races of that season for car owner Carl Kerfenhofer. Fox's engine won the 1960 Daytona 500 with Junior Johnson driving. Then three more wins that season with David Pearson. As a car owner, Fox won 14 events, had 16 poles and 200 starts. Junior Johnson had nine, Buck Baker twice. Uh, so this guy goes back a ways on 90 years old. Uh, Fox retired from racing in the early 70s, returning as an official, as an inspector for NASCAR in 1990, so both uh, men, uh, we lost some great guys in NASCAR, and, and, and these guys were the pioneers, so uh, our prayers go out to the family and friends of those two individuals, Ray Fox and uh, Junie Dunlawney. Um, and real quick, Michigan. We had the, the Cup of Michigan. Jimmy Johnson won, Kevin Harvick uh, was second, he had the pole. Brad Keselowski was third. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Paul Menard was fourth, Casey Kane sixth, Jeff Gordon sixth. Dale Earnhardt Jr. was 7th, Kyle Larson was 8th, Joey Logano 9th, Clint Boyer was 10th. Pretty well uneventful race, and I, I couldn't get into it for some reason. I don't know if I was tired or not, but... What's that sound like? Uh, well, it's, it just was one of those things. <laughs> nationwide. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the nationwide was also... I think they need to dirty up the cars a little bit. I'm thinking. Paul Menard won the nationwide race in Michigan with Sam Hornis Jr. second, Dale Earnhardt Jr. third, Kyle Busch uh, fourth from the pole, Brian Scott uh, fifth. Uh, let's see, Chase Elliott was sixth, Reagan Smith seventh, Kyle Larson eighth, Ty Dillon ninth, and Chris Boucher rounding out the top ten. In the Camping World Truck Series at Gateway Motorsports Park, Darrell Wallace Jr. was the winner with German Cuarga Jr. second, Timothy Peters third, Johnny Sorter fourth, Ron Hornaday Jr. fifth. Cole Custer won the 21 Means 21 Pole Award because he's still under age and he can't have the Coors Light sticker. Ryan Bellini was second. John West Townley was eighth. Chase Pistone was ninth. And Taylor Molson was tenth. So uh, I believe they're in Sonoma this weekend coming up uh, out in the Napa Valley. So cup racing. It's changed over the years. What do you think has caused that? As a competitor on a local level, did some touring racing. What's caused that? Yeah. Must have been a big team that had a lot of money. Yeah. One of the rules change. Uh-huh. But uh, I wasn't a fan of the COT car. Not me either. Um, I really stopped watching NASCAR when they went to it. Mm -hmm. 
with all their engineers that they got these days, uh, you didn't have to be a genius to figure out that a wing, when you turn it around and go the other way, is going to lift the car off the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they got the wind tunnel to test it. Um, they put a lot of people in danger. Uh, drivers, fans. Uh, I wasn't a fan of it. Didn't like the wing. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the I like the car they have today. I think it's better. The Gen Six car. I. I'd like to see the splitters and all that stuff gone. Mm -hmm. um, I miss the Kelly Arbor days, the Richard Petty days, uh, Lake Speed. You know, them guys were wheeling. Mm -hmm. They were on biosupply tire, no radials, out there, Daytona sideways, sliding it, smoking the right rear. They were wheeling. That was fun, entertaining to watch. They might have been strung out, but they put on a good race. They did. They raced, you know, right now, everything is air. Everything's aero, um, and the stands were full. Yeah. Stands were full, you know, parking lot, campers were full. I think they're missing part of that mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, you can tell the difference in the race cars. Right now, you look at the TV real quick, you can't tell if it's a Toyota, a Ford, a Chevy. You know, uh, obviously, you know, you got to really look at the sticker pack, but mm -hmm. uh, I can walk over, peel the sticker pack off, put a, a, a Toyota sticker pack on, and it's a Chevy car, you know? Exactly. Uh, I don't like so much of the templates. You know, one manufacturer was a little better. They did their homework. You know, that, that was part of the job. You, you're taking the manufacturer support out of racing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that was a big complaint a couple of years ago. You know, um, now the, with the chassis and stuff like that, you're very limited on what you can do to them. Mm -hmm. In-house being, you know, built chassis was a, a big deal. I mean, you know, Kyle Busch, he's building late models, trucks, Busch cars, cup cars, whatever, you know. His cars work. Why are they working? Exactly. You know, um, he's a driver who knows how to set up a race car. And uh, I was down at South Boston with him, watching him work on his late model one day. Uh, I was running my modified down there. He is, whether you like him or not, he's a driver because he knows setup. He knows how to work on the car. And that's how you're going to be fast. And that's how I grew up, you know. you got to know what you need in the race car. If I can't be the crew chief in my seat, you're not going to be fast. Right. You know, uh, yeah, you need a crew chief. I can bounce ideas back and forth while the race is going on. And he can make some suggestions. And I say, you know what, it doesn't really feel like that. Maybe we need to do this and maybe compromise a little bit. And that's what makes the car faster. Right. You know, um, the good relationship. You know, maybe uh, Jimmy Johnson and Chad Canals have that relationship. Jeff Gordon and uh, Ray Everham, they had that connection. Oh, they did. You know, um, you know Ray Everham ran the, uh, the ROC cars, mm -hmm. which I missed, by the way. You know what, but now we got 43 ROC cars. Exactly. You know, and in some aspects, I almost feel like NASCAR should just own the cars and we come there and lease them. Well, you know, it's, it's and I say that tongue in cheek sometimes is, you know, that eventually, you know, if you want to race, you go to NASCAR, you buy your motor, buy your car, and, and here's the schedule and go race. And, and I see that coming to a degree, um, especially with, with the modified. So um, I, I don't know. And then Kevin Basic from Long Island E for Speed is asking, do you think the modified should go back to a regular car body? Well, a modified is a modified. You know, um, growing up, we had Pintos, Cavaliers, Pontiac 2000s. Vegas. Vegas, chopped up, you know, coupes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? <laughs> I got on my figure eight car is a modified body that I'm not allowed to run. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no advantage to it. 
you know, but uh, I think it would be cool to have something like that, you know, the Pintos. The one car that I've always loved was Bob Gabarino's Dodge Stuff. Yes. That and Eddie DeHunt's Ford Pro. Mm-hmm. Those were unique cars that were different, um, that made it a little bit interesting to the fans. Right. You know, uh, we had Don Howe with the Beretta, that awesome Beretta. That was parked next to my father for years. Yep. I love that car, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I, I don't know if they should go to a stock body, right. but I think um, you should be able to make them different. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, basically, uh, you know, in 2011 there, they turned it into a template. I think you should have a roof height and go racing. And go racing. As I long agree. as it's safe. You know, um, these new quarter bars that we affectionately call, you know, the blue at bars mm -hmm. are dangerous. Right. And as an official, you would never know that because you haven't been behind the wheel of a car. But as soon as you touch pipe to pipe, the car in front of you is going around. Right. You know, we had those big I-beam bumpers. You hit the back of the bumper, the guy in front of you would stay straight. Now... You know, with the with the cars being so low and, and everything, you can't see through the car in front of you anymore. You always hover it off to the side a little bit, and the guy has to check up a little bit, and you hit him in that quarter bar, he's mm -hmm. going around. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I noticed that at Stafford. I was in Wade's car, which was my car <laughs> that, that I was supposed to drive, and, and we were just going out for the pit party, and the car in front of me, I couldn't see past him. And we weren't at speed. We were just going out for the pit party. Yeah. And I was like, holy cow, did he, how did he erase like this? You know? I'm like, you, you, like you said, you got to go underneath or go to the outside just a little bit to get a vantage point. You used to be able to see through the windshield. R.J. Faber, you told me when I first started, look through the windshield of the guy in front of you. Yeah. You'll see what's happening. You can't do that today. No, and, uh, you know, when I first started racing modifieds, I could look through three rows of cars, you know. Um, nowadays, you can't do that no more. Uh, one of the problems is, is us trying to sit so low in the cars to keep the center of gravity yeah. down. That is an issue. Yeah. You know, but a lot of fans don't realize what we deal with as drivers. Right. We can't see the right front. Right. You know, or barely see the right front. So you, you get up on the guy's quarter bar. It it, uh, it happens, you know, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not that you intend to do it, no. but there's a hole you stick it in there, you know. You do what you got to do. You're racing. We're, we're not here running parade laps, you and know. Not every accident, I said it, not every crash that happens on a race, I guess, on purpose. But the one thing is, is the drivers should deal with it. Mm-hmm. Because I, I'm one where... My crew guys tell me if I do something wrong, you know, and I get out, and sometimes the crew guys say, oh, he did this to you. He did what are you talking about? He never touched me. Right. You know, uh, why are you even arguing with him? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, my guys, I tell them not to argue. You know, th there's a lot of rules kind of that I have set in place. Mm -hmm. I'm always one that, you know, if something happens on the racetrack, one of my probably downfalls is I go right to the driver mm -hmm. instead of maybe giving them a couple of minutes to cool off or something, you know, maybe wait until next week or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. I want, I, I want them to know, listen, you know, it was just a racing accident, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, maybe I was trying to hang on to the car or save the car. I got hit from behind and, you know, anything. Yeah. There's a lot that people don't realize, and uh, even my crew guys, I had an in-car camera one day, and, and I had a car in front of me in practice, and they seen how much the car in front of me was moving around. And he goes, you can't even see that from the stands. You can't see that from the pits standing in turn. I said, no, you can't. I said, but this is what I'm telling you. You know, a car gets a little out of shape. You stick your nose there, and he comes back with, and where his car is pointed straight again, he slaps you in the right front, either you go up over him, you go to the infield, you don't realize these things. No, no, you know, unless you sat in a seat, you don't know that. No, I mean, look at the guys in, at Daytona, you know, with the side draft and, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you could suck a guy right into you. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you're on the edge. All the time. 
all, all the time. time. Hey, we're about to, speaking of time, we're out of time. We got like a minute left. So, Tom, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come down tonight. I know, I know between working on your job and working on your cars and, and being a single dad, it's tough for you time-wise. So I appreciate that you took this time out. And, uh, you know, for all of us who do this, you know, it, it's, we do what we got to do because we love the sport, with a sport we call racing. That's what we're here for. That's and, what we're uh, here for. I do appreciate it. It, it was fun. It was. Thank you. Anyway, well, I'm off to Waterford this weekend for the, the Wheel and Modified Tour Race. I think it'll be my first attempt at being a crew chief because I'm not approved for Waterford. So my car will actually be there. And the driver is TBA to be announced, to, talking to two different people uh, to run the car. And, and, and I'm not sure if that decision was made yet who it's going to be, but I will be the crew chief. Which what is time does this kick off? <laughs> <laughs> Saturday night at Waterford Street Bowl. Um, so it, it should be interesting. So uh, if, if you're not going to your local racetrack, head up to Waterford for the tour race. It should be a good one. And speaking of a good one, wherever you are going this weekend, please be safe, be careful. Tell somebody you love them, and God bless you all. Thanks for listening and watching. Good night.